why I did that. So I was going to start with um, someone emailed me looking looking at question twenty five in terms of where orbitals go, how we form sig how many what's the difference between sigma and pi bonds, how we form pi bonds. I didn't get a chance to answer them back by email, but I figured probably somebody else has that question. Or if not, I can ask you questions as we go through that. So, um, and the other thing, well, I got a couple things. I'm gonna try and record the lecture, so that way it can, that way you can go back and review it if necessary, or if you miss, then you can um, see what we did. I don't think you'll be able to answer, but you'll see it on the video and you could choose your um, appropriate answers which one you would think it is um, okay so the problems in the reading there were some settings that I hadn't played with like show the correct answer or um, attempts so from here on out what I will do for today's um, even though there's a grade book in top hat I have to move that to Canvas because Canvas is the official grade book. So your participation points for every class and for the homeworks, and it's going to be a lot of columns, I guess, here unless I combine them all together in chapter one, but that'll all be on Canvas. So I have to download this on a spreadsheet and figure it out. There's going to be a delay of anywhere from you know half a day to five days probably for me to do that, but the official um, the official grade book is Canvas, not Top Hat. So I can manipulate things like today I can give everybody participation and correct points for the, what you read. Um, but in the future what I'm going to do is there's each question is 50% is a half a point participation half a point for correctness. I'm going to give you two attempts on those problems in the reading and then I'll, it'll show you the correct answer if you don't get it right after two. Okay. And remember these are small points so if you don't if you miss the first time you can go back and kind of take a look at it and so I'm going to do that that was not the way it was set up for today. Then there are homework problems at the end of each chapter. So in the, I guess in my dashboard, well, I don't want to move away from this, but in my dashboard it has the chapter, it has the reading, and then it has homework problems underneath it. The homework problems are going to be due two periods after we end a chapter. Okay, so and I go through the problems both in the reading and at the end of the chapter and I remove the problems that I don't want you to answer. So if I say, hey, we're going to skip this section and there's no problems in that section, that's because I took all the problems out. So if there's problems in a section, it doesn't mean skip it, it means that it, like, it's going to be less, um, if I said read, sort of skim through it, or it's going to be less, um, it's going to be something that's less emphasized. But there's still problems on it. So for the homework problems, like today we're chapter one, first half of chapter one, Friday, second half of chapter one, then I'm going to consider Monday to be the next lab class period even though we don't have it, and so then the chapter one homework problems will be due next Wednesday. So that's when we finish a chapter, the homework problems are then going to be due not the next period, but the period after that. And you could go into the homework problems and start answering them. And I'm going to do the same thing there. Two attempts, um, and also then it'll show you the correct answer. So I'm going to set that up. I didn't investigate that I had all that capability, so now I know. Um, somebody emailed and said it'd be nice to 
know what the correct answer is. Um, that still doesn't stop you from asking a question about it. If you see the correct answer and it doesn't quite make sense, that's something that you can bring to class and we can talk about. But that's how it's going to be. So two attempts and, and you'll do that. And if there's any questions, I am going to have to go back and I'm going to have to put all this stuff on Canvas anyway, which means I have the ability to sort of manipulate things. Um, so there may, there's a couple questions that, that weren't graded because if it's a text, if it's a writing question, there's no artificial intelligence in this to answer that question. So what was the unique feature about NO, nitric oxide? That was a question of mine that I wrote. And so I took me a while to figure out where I see all of your answers. And so when I look through the answers, the what was the unique thing about NO? Free radical. It's got a it's got an unpaired electron, which is what we call free radical. You could have said it had incomplete octets, had an odd number of electrons overall. Anything along those lines was what makes nitric, acid, uh, nitric oxide unique. It also makes it unstable. And in chemistry, things that are unstable are very reactive. And so nitric oxide is one of those. Um, there's therapies built on nitric oxide release in the body um, to then have it react very quickly with certain other with certain biomolecules. So I can add a question like that. I, then I just have to go through and grade it. Okay. <coughs> right. So is that kind of clear in terms of the difference between the homework problems and the in in the reading problems? Hopefully that'll make that'll make things a little more efficient. If you have if you go through and you have a suggestion, you know, maybe maybe we need three attempts. I'll take it under consideration. Right. Um, but anything like that, let me know because as I go through here, I want to use this the most efficiently. So okay, question number twenty-five. So with this question number twenty-five, they're kind of asking you. And they've also got the structure wrong for a selenium ion. I'll write the correct one here. But they're asking you which of these energy diagrams would be the, the appropriate one for oxygen. And so before we do that, let's, let me go back and sort of write that structure of what the a selenium ion that their writing would look like. So I think they had an H and they had a plus charge, right? No, they just have one pair. Okay. So the first question that I would ask about this is, I would ask what Right, with two hydrogens. With two hydrogens attached to that carbon, I just violated the octet rule. So I only have one hydrogen attached there. So when they have three in that question, they have three hydrogens attached to that carbon, they're like massively violating the octet rule. So there just should be one. Okay, there's one. So let me ask a question. What's the hybridization of that carbon atom? David. SP. SP? Do we agree with that? Okay, so that's an SP. How did you how do you know that it's SP? Okay, so it's got a triple bond, but only one of those bond counts. 
Anybody different answer or just restate that a little bit differently? There, in the triple bonding, doesn't there tend to be the, the P orbitals tend to form the overlapping on the outside one? Tends to be the coloring, and then on the inside, it's the sp hybridized orbital in the middle that forms the triple bond. Okay, so, and that's similar to what you're saying. Basically, what we want to know is I want to know how many hybrid orbitals that carbon has. And how do I count hybrid orbitals? Well, there's a formula the number of hybrid orbitals equals the number of sigma bonds or single bonds because a pi bond either one or two pi bonds a double or triple bond only counts as one bond so in this case that carbon has two single bonds and the single bonds come from the hybrid orbitals overlapping. The multiple bonds, the pi bonds come from the p orbitals being parallel to each other and sideways overlapping, which is the pi bond. So for carbon, we just count up the number of sigma bonds or single bonds. That gives us the number of hybrid orbitals. If I have two hybrid orbitals, that means I have S and P. I've got SP hybridization. Okay. What's the hybridization of the oxygen? Can we use the same formula? Well, we can use the same formula with a modification. I need to deal with lone pairs. So where do lone pairs go? Do lone pairs go in the hybrid orbitals, or do the lone pairs go in the p orbitals? I heard p. I heard hybrid. When I form a pi bond with two sideways p orbitals overlapping, how many electrons are typically in that p orbital? One apiece? Okay. So if they have one apiece, if we have two p orbitals that are going to sideways overlap, they typically have one electron each. Rarely do they have two. Because these are, they're pairing up, right? So that forces then all the lone pairs, right? The lone pairs have to be in the hybrid orbitals. And so that's one of the, the fundamental things in terms of looking at hybridization is that the p orbitals will have the unpaired electron and the hybrid orbitals will have either an unpaired electron that's going to overlap head to head to form the sigma bond or it's going to have the lone pairs. So lone pairs go to the hybrid orbitals. Okay. Right. Everybody okay with that? So I'm going to modify my for I'm going to modify my formula so that it'll work with any atom. The number of hybrid orbitals equals the number of sigma bonds plus the number of lone pairs. So if I now modify my formula that way, I can use that to determine the number of hybrid orbitals in any atom. So now if I have that formula, what's the hybridization of the oxygen? SP. Right? Because I've got one pair of electrons, one sigma bond, SP, so I've got SP, two SP hybrid orbitals. So that means this oxygen is also SP. 
with the the number of electrons that is around oxygen, why is it positive? So that positive is the formal charge. Well, that's the formal that's charge. That's the formal charge. Oh. So in in organic rarely do we end up with plus two or plus three charges or minus two or minus three. So typically you'll just see a plus or a minus. Usually in a circle to keep it away from everything else. So that oxygen has a plus one charge. And we can go back to the formula that we talked about um, on whatever day it was, Monday. It's only Wednesday, isn't it? And then we can say, okay, calculating the formal charge. We didn't talk about the formula. I talked about it at 8 o'clock this morning. That's how it's going to be a long semester. So formal charge. How do we calculate the formal charge? There's a formula. I probably got it wrong this morning, so I'm not going to write it again. But here's how I remember formal charge. A neutral oxygen atom has how many valence electrons? Six. Six. Right? It's got two pairs, two unpaired. So a neutral oxygen atom comes to a molecule owning six electrons. How many electrons in this structure does that oxygen own? Now it shares, it shares, it's sharing eight. It's sharing, it owns these two outright. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, it's sharing six, but overall it's, it's got eight. You're right. Sharing six. But overall, it's got eight, right? If I, it's it's okay with the octet rule. So it's sharing six. Sorry, my rule of sharing is ownership plus sharing, which isn't really sharing. So, okay, it shares six. It's got two of its own. It's an octet. So, how many does it own? It owns two outright from the lone pair that it owns. Plus, it owns how many in each bond? Half of that, which is one. So if the oxygen and carbon split, the oxygen should pick up three of its electrons and the carbon will get the other three. So that means that oxygen owns a grand total of five. Remember, it came with six. It now owns five. What was the net effect? It lost one electron plus one charge. So that's the way I like I said I if you got if I have to to you know whip off a formula I this there's only very few things in here anymore and so formulas if I don't need a formula I'm not going to put a formula there so I'm just going to kind of think it through so oxygen comes with six it's got five plus one charge okay Car the other carbon is okay it's sharing it's truly sharing eight it owns four, but that's okay. It came with four, so it has no formal charge. It's got a formal charge of zero. Okay. okay, so also remember that atoms don't necessarily have to have the same hybridization to be bonded together. The fact that this carbon to oxygen or SP, that's not required. That's not a requirement. That's not a rule. Um, so the oxygen is sp hybridized right now i'm working towards number 25 which said how should the electron diagram look so i'm going to have two sp hybrid orbitals and then i'm going to have two unhybridized orbitals so <coughs> In terms of the electrons, what for that oxygen, what electrons, and I've got what, six to play with here? 
Actually, I only have five now, don't I? So how, where should those electrons go? One in the SP, right, that's bonded to the carbon? And then where should the lone pair go? It should go in the SP hybrid orbital. And then for the P, P's always have the unpaired electrons. So the elect the electron the electronic uh, diagram would look something like that, where the lone pair has to go in the SP orbital and not in the P orbitals. Okay, because lone pairs always go in the hybrid orbitals. Does that kind of make sense? It was, it, was, it was kind of a tricky question in terms of there were a number of steps you had to get to before you got to the diagram. Um, and, had, and had you known explicitly that the lone pairs have to go into the hybrid orbitals, I think that was there was only one choice. Okay. So what is this so what would this look like? Well, if I draw out an SP hybridized carbon, or if I draw out any SP hybridized atom, it's going to look like that. With my three SP hybrid orbitals that are trigonal planar, right, in their geometry. And then what's going to be, what am I missing? Yes. What was I thinking? It was SP2. Sometimes I do that just to make sure everybody's awake. Most of the time I just most of the time it's a metal typo. So yes, you're right. We need two. And sometimes I like high, sometimes I shade them because that tells me they're hybrid orbitals. So right, Vesper theory, if you have two two orbitals, they gotta be 180 degrees away from each other because they're big balloons of negative charge and they're going to repel each other as much as possible and that's 180 degrees. I got two P orbitals left over, P1, P2, or Px, Py, Py, Pz, it doesn't matter. And so there's my two P orbitals. And for the carbon atom, how many valence electrons does it have? Four because it's undergone excitement. And so the hybrid orbitals get one electron and P orbitals get one electron. That electron spends 50% of its time up here and 50% of its time down there. So there is my SP hybridized carbon atom. And actually if I erase the C, that is my SP hybridized any atom. Except the number of electrons that goes into that shell of the sp hybrid orbital varies depending on the element. So when I write my oxygen, I'm going to do the same thing. Here's my two hybrid orbitals, here's my p, and there's my second p. So there's my sp hybridized oxygen. Now how many electrons need to go into that? Five, right? So, one, well actually five, no, not five. For, a new, for the oxygen atom, it's going to have one, it's going to have the lone pair on the outside, it's going to have here and here. So, for oxygen, I'm going to put in five electrons. Okay. Following the rule that the lone pair has got to go in the hybrid orbital. Everybody with me? Now why am I doing this? Because I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to answer the second part of that question in terms of how do the sigma bonds form, how do the pi bonds form. So 
take a look at, at this structure and let me do this. Let me put the hydrogen there so it's, so it's a linear geometry. I need a hydrogen over here, which is spherical. And so now I'm going to overlap the sp hybrid orbital with the s of hydrogen. And I form my CH bond that's here. I'm going to form my sigma bond between my carbon and my oxygen by overlapping these two hybrid orbitals. So that's going to form an sp sp sigma bond. And so now I've attached the carbon to the hydrogen and to the oxygen. Now my octets, I still have to follow the octet rule. So now I need to share electrons between the carbon and the oxygen. So I share my first pair. Two p orbitals that are parallel to each other now overlap. That would be the two orbitals that are in the plane up and down of the board. So there's my first pi bond. And both lobes make one pi bond. And then the orbitals that are like this, they're coming out of the board and going behind the board. Those two are parallel to each other. They're going to overlap and that's going to form my second pi bond. So this is going to look like a carbon-carbon triple bond only with an oxygen. So the p orbitals are always formed from p, or the pi bonds are always formed from p orbitals that are parallel and they sideways overlap. That's the definition of a pi bond. The sideways overlap of the p orbitals. The sigma bonds are head-to-head -head overlap of usually hybrid orbitals. Usually always hybrid orbitals because we never overlap a p orbital head-to-head. -head. It's always overlap side-to-side. -side. And a spherical like hydrogen it doesn't have a direction so it just gets overlapped that way. So that's what that molecule would look like. And that's how we tell what the hybridization of non-carbon atoms is, is by just adjusting this formula, saying lone pairs need to go in the hybrid orbitals, and now the number of hybrid orbitals are the sigma bonds plus the lone pairs. Do we tend, or sorry, do the, do the atoms tend to overlap their... Uh, SP orbitals because they're lower energy and then they won't repulse each other as much? Probably, but they're the only orbitals that can really overlap head to head. Because you can't take a P orbital, we don't take P orbitals and we don't overlap them head to head. They're, they're best built to overlap sideways. So I, I guess that would be the case if you want to get into something like molecular orbital theory that we're not going to get into, you're going to overlap the lower energy orbitals first and then the higher energy orbitals second. And in that diagram, sp is lower than p. So yeah, I, I think that would probably be the case. Uh, why are the low pairs, like, why do they go to the hybrid orbitals? What's the reason? Well, because if I put a if I put an unpaired electron in a hybrid orbital, it, well, if I put a if I put a pair of electrons into a p orbital, what kind of p orbital can I sideways overlap that with? And then it can't like another. Well, normally our p orbitals have. We're going to get to p orbitals that don't have anything in them, but normally our p orbitals have like one electron in them. So if I put two electrons here and one electron here, there's no sharing, right? I'd have to say, well, I have to kick an electron out and then share, but where would that electron go? It would go to the hybrid orbital that has one 
unpaired electron and make it paired. So the reason is, is because when we're overlapping p orbitals, we're overlapping one electron each. And our, and our hybrid orbitals that have lone pairs are outside the molecule. They're not used for bonding that molecule. All right, so does that make sense? Does that answer the question? I think it was Hannah. Does that answer the question? Nobody wants to identify themselves as Hannah. That's okay. But does that does that help? So I'm not hearing any yell, no. Then I guess maybe Hannah's in the morning class. It'll be it's going to be a couple. It'll be a week or so before I begin. I got a whole other set of students that have already left my head, and now I've got a new set to bring in. So it's going to take a few weeks. All right. So. So does that help in terms of looking at hybridization? This hybridization was one of the big topics from from this from this drawing Lewis dot structures um, and then getting into hybridization because hybridization is really why Vesper theory works the way that it does, and then the Vesper theory gives us our molecular geometries that for Friday we're going to talk about then in terms of polarity, whether a molecule's polar or not, that leads into intermolecular forces. All right. So, okay. Any questions about any, any of the topics? Um, there was a question, I don't know which one it was, but it was about resonance structures. In the textbook, it said you shouldn't have two like charges next to each other, but having two opposite charges next to each other does not make it more stable or less stable. It depends. Um, if you have, when you're drawing your resonance structure, when you're drawing resonance structures, if you end up with two atoms that have the same charge next to each other, they're obviously going to repel. Um, well, I'll give you an example that we'll get to. That we'll get to later on. Okay. So a nit a nitro group is called is an NO two group. It's called a nitro group, and nitro groups have an N double bonded to an oxygen, and then it's also double bonded to a single bonded oxygen. The double bonded oxygen has two lone pairs. The single bonded oxygen has three lone pairs. A nitro group itself is neutral because this oxygen has a minus one formal charge, and the nitrogen only has four electrons, and so it came with five, so it's got a positive charge. Okay, so that's what a nitro group look lo looks like. In nitro groups, we will use well that positive nitrogen when you attach it to something. That positive nitrogen group sucks the electron density out of whatever it's attached to, and so those are going to be called electron withdrawing groups. Nitro also in organic molecules can easily be decomposed to NO2. So these are usually used in like fuels, nitromethane, I think they use in like drag racers and stuff um, because it's a very high energy fuel because when it breaks apart and forms the, the NO2 gas, that, that leads to a higher heat of combustion. But that's just side, those are just facts. If this carbon next to it was to somehow get a positive charge in a resonance structure, that would be an unstable resonance structure so that it would actually not even form. And so that's an example of where the two positive charges are next to each other. Now, 
let's say let's say I had the well, no let's let me go to one of the problems that I had for today where am I at here? Oh, I'm in the book. I need to stop. And Okay, here, is, here are three resonance structures <coughs> for CH3NCO. Okay. And so my first question is going to be, and I'll give you a minute or two here to um, determine this, what are the formal charges in each of these, for the atoms in each of these three resonance structures. Everybody have the have some the formal charges. So let's start with structure A. Let's start with this with this nitrogen right here. Can you see the little hand? Is there a little hand there? Yes. So that nitrogen. So since we don't, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna use the phones to do this. So we'll do it the old-fashioned way. This is zero. This is plus one. This is minus one. Okay. Got it? So on the count of three, and I will go one, two, and I won't say the three, then I want you to hold up your, what you think the charge is. Okay, and we'll go down the line. And if you're like this, looking around, then changing, this is why we use the anonymous clickers to begin with. So make your choice, hang with it. There's no penalty for being wrong. Okay, that nitrogen. One, two. Okay, I see some zeros, I see a minus one. Zero. How's it zero? Remember, nitrogen comes with five. It owns one, two, three, four, five. No change. Okay. How about the carbon? One, two, three. Okay. It came with four. It owns four. Oxygen on the end, one, two, three. Still zero. So that, in A, all of the nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms have zero formal charges. Okay? So let's go to B. 
How about this nitrogen on the end of the triple bond? What's its charge? Okay, one, two, okay, plus one. It's got four, came with five, lost one, plus one. The carbon, one, two, zero. And then the oxygen, one, two, minus one, okay? Because it now has six. Okay. So now you can just yell out an answer. How about this nitrogen right here in C? Negative one, okay? Carbon, oxygen, plus one. Okay. So the overall charge on this molecule is zero. But here are three distinctively different resonance structures. Okay. So we have to mentally, well, we don't have to mentally, well, we sort of have to mentally. Try to CNO. or NCO. All right, let's just leave it there. You have your charges written down, right? So, because I can't write, I can't write on this. I can only write on PowerPoints. My ultimate question up here at the top is, which structure is most stable? A. A? Everybody agree with that? Okay. Why is A the most stable? Uh, because none of the atoms in the molecule has a charge whatsoever. Like okay. There's no formal charges on any There's no formal charges on any of the atoms. So when we're looking at de determining the stability of a structure, the number one rule is that they all have to have octets. If a structure is missing an octet, it's then going to be the, the, we, the most unstable. So our criteria for tie breaking these is number one, is there any without full octets? And so in this case, all of them have full octets, so they're tied. So the next thing we do is we go to charges. We want low charges and low numbers of charges. Right? So A has no formal charges. It's going to be the most stable. Now for B... The oxygen's minus one and the nitrogen's positive one. For C, what's, what is it? It's the opposite, right? Nitrogen minus one, oxygen plus one. So for B and C, they both have a plus one, minus one charge, so they're tied. And, I, and it's very... Possible. I know that your question was like, could atoms could atoms have opposite charges next to each other? They could. I'll show you an example in a moment. But we have negative and a positive charge in both of those structures, so they're tied. So now we go to the third tiebreaker, which is what? Which is going to be well. The charges got to go with electronegativity. They have to match up. So given that, which one of these two, a B or C, which one is more stable, do you think? B or C? How many people say B is more stable? How many people say C is more stable? How many people don't know? Okay. So... What does it mean for the charge to go with electronegativity? 
Which one of those two elements, nitrogen or oxygen, is more electronegative? Oxygen because it goes C, N, O. On the periodic table, electronegativity moves towards fluorine because it's the most electronegative. Okay, so what does nit if nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, or oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, what does the oxygen want to have? A positive or a negative charge? Negative. Wants to have a negative. So that means B would be more stable because the oxygen is more electronegative. It's going to attract that negative charge more than nitrogen. And so oxygen will take the negative charge and nitrogen will take the positive charge. Again, neither one happily because the most stable resonance structure is to have no charge. And as a matter of fact, when I average all three of those structures out, what do I get? I get A. Right? So A is the most stable resonance structure, but B and C are viable ones as well. So if I was to write another resonance, if I was to write another structure, how about I do N3 minus? So in N3 minus, <coughs> the, what we would do is we would have the nitrogen has three or has five valence electrons, so I would put five valence electrons around each of the nitrogens. And now I'm going to do what? I'm going to share to get everything to be an octet. So let's see, how am I going to share that? Um, oh, sorry, N3 minus. What do I need to do? This is just the nitrogens that are neutral. I need to put an electron in. So where should I put it? It doesn't matter. I'll put it here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share these two, which then gives me a double bond between that those two nitrogens. And what am I going to do now? How about I do this? How about I share these two nitrogens to form a double bond, but then that violates the octet rule right at the moment. So I'm going to pick this electron up, and I'm going to move it over to that nitrogen and pair it up. So I'm going to end up with... I can move electrons around, I can pick them up, I can move them, just don't lose them along the way. Don't have them multiply and don't lose them. So now the formal charge on the nitrogen on the left is going to be, it's got two, four, five, six, so it's going to be minus one. The middle nitrogen has a formal charge of plus one. The nitrogen on the right side has a charge of minus one. That's a perfectly legitimate resonance structure to have the plus charge next to the minus charge. Because right? that's what you asked about before I went off on my tangent of the other things, right? So that resonance structure is perfectly fine. Now there's two other resonance structures that I could draw for this. Well, that sounds like the end. I guess you guys were saved by the bell. But there are two other resonance structures that you can draw for this. Can I ask you to draw those other two for Friday and then randomly call on somebody and have them read it to me? 
because maybe by Friday then I can have everybody's. And when I mean randomly, I pull out my iPad and I have this program that just randomly chooses students. So that way nobody can, that way no, I'm not picking on anybody. But there's two more resonance structures for this. So just as a exercise that we'll start with, and remind me that we're starting with this on Friday, let's go ahead and, and try and write those two. Well, if you had any questions about, well, I have a couple questions I'll ask on Friday about hybridization. For Friday, the rest of chapter one, and the problems within that, and it's on intermolecular forces and polarity. So we'll have a little bit of time to go back to this if there's any questions. Otherwise, send me an email, uh, or we will uh, we can do it on Friday. Okay. So I will see you then.